Testing. Rick, can you hear me? Okay, can can Michael, can you turn on your microphone? And I just want to see Rick if you can hear him on the live stream because that's key. Good morning, fellas. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing good. Rick, can you hear Michael on the live stream? Okay, perfect, perfect. So, um, just give me, uh, just give me a two minutes here, Michael. I'm gonna make a post, and then I'll send it to you in here, and you can retweet it, and uh, we'll get this thing going. Copy that. So, I'll just give you a quick heads up. Obviously, I kind of sent you the <clears throat> the plan for today. We have a lot of great questions from people uh, in my Discord and on Twitter. Uh, so I think that will take up probably the lion's share of the time. I'm going to make a quick comment at the start regarding the last podcast, and that's really all I want to talk about it. I don't really want to focus on that that negativity or the waste of time that that was any more than we should. Uh, and then we'll just go forward because I know there's a lot of people who do want to hear from you as someone who's been in the markets for 25 years and helped so many people, and that's what I want the focus to be on. So uh, I'll make a quick comment at the start, and then we'll... Uh, We'll uh, get on with things. So just give me two minutes here and I'll tweet out the link. Gotcha. All right, I just chatted you, Michael, the tweet link, so. All right, looks like people are Joining here, can people on the uh, people in the live stream hear me? Michael, you can go ahead and retweet that. You should be able to see the retweet. Perfect. Okay, can you guys hear Michael? Good morning, good morning, good morning. Perfect. So let's just give it a couple minutes here, let a few more people hop on, and then let's uh, let's get going here. All right. Just so you know, I'm not familiar with the 
Discord. So if there's people posting questions like the last uh, podcast I joined with you, I don't really see those questions, and I'd really prefer not to. I love you guys. Yeah. Don't, like, drive the questions. No, I already have all the questions that we're going to talk uh, about already already done up, so we don't got to worry about that. They're asking if you can just turn your your volume up a little bit there, Michael, on your voice. And yes, this will go on YouTube. Okay, we've got already over a hundred people on here, so let's let's get started uh, with the podcast. So, obviously, very excited to uh, to attempt number two uh, podcast with uh, Michael here. I am ICT, so I really appreciate him coming back and uh, and uh, you know giving me a shot to. To, to chat with him as I know I've learned a lot from him. He's someone, you know, I've I've considered very much a mentor in the trading space and, you know, therefore I'm very excited to, uh, you know, chat with him. I know a lot of you have questions. Uh, so I'm very quickly, guys, going to make a comment about the last podcast and that's basically all I want to talk to it, uh, talk about it. Uh, I it, In all, I think the majority of it was a waste of time. It was kind of disappointing, but I want to start with this. First of all, I want to stop with all of the hating, whether it's directed at ICT, whether it's directed at Flood. Um, all of that is a waste of time. All of that is a waste of energy. I'm very confident that most of the people on Twitter and Discord who are talking shit to whoever it is haven't put in the time to actually see what this person knows. Personally, I know flood helps a lot of people for free i genuinely do think he's inherently a good person at the end of the day i think the situation was handled poorly but that's neither he nor there flood has put himself in a position where he is able to uh not really have to care what people think you know when you're successful that's something that comes with it and that's okay um and people who are talking shit about him just because of that podcast, I don't think have done the time to research in a flood to see that he does do a lot for the crypto community. And the same goes for Michael. I think most of the people who hate on Michael uh, haven't put in the time to find out for themselves whether or not uh, his systems work or whatever it is. Uh, I think that most of the people will do a quick Google search. They'll find that he blew an account 10 10 years ago and you guys know the internet never forgets and they base their complete picture of the guy based on that and what other people say. I was there guys. When I first found ICT, I did the research. I found negative things about him online as you do with anyone you research online for the most part. Uh, and I had my trepidations, but the difference was, is I said, you know what, just like trading, I'm going to be objective here and I'm going to make my own opinion based on the content. Forget about the person, forget about what the internet says, forget about what other people are telling you. There is enough stuff in those videos, the Scout Sniper series, the Precision series, the Market Maker series, which are all posted for free uh, on his forum and on YouTube, that I was able to profitably trade crypto, Forex, just with those videos. That's what allowed me to form my opinion. That's what gave me the confidence to go into the mentorship with no trepidations. Because I put the time in, I formed my own opinion rather than letting people on the internet uh, who are dredging things up from years ago uh, make an opinion for me. Michael is not the first person to blow a live account. I know many of you have blown live accounts. Maybe you just haven't publicly shared them. Many of you do that because you know when you go live, especially if you're publicly sharing that with people, it changes the game. Um, secondly, Michael's not the first person to do a rebrand. Lots of you guys have done rebrands. Uh, in the age of internet, everything is screenshotted, everything is saved, so it's a lot harder to do than it may have used to been. But at the end of the day, I say, you know, for me, none of that shit mattered. Um, go through his Twitter yourself. Uh, go through his forum yourself. Go through the content yourself and then make an opinion. Forget what everyone else says. Um, I, if you're you're doing yourself a disservice by writing this guy off based on what you find online if you haven't given the videos and the content a chance to see if it works for you I think you're doing yourself a disservice and uh, you know I, 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 I say if you want to have an opinion about the guy put in the time check the videos out get in the charts and actually try the stuff if it doesn't work for you at that point go ahead 
form your opinion. But until you've done so, I think you're you're wasting your time and you're just you're just blowing smoke by talking shit because it's the thing to do. I'm very confident a lot of you could spend this energy a lot better improving yourselves as people and traders rather than hating on people that you don't know on the internet. This goes for Flood and Michael hating on either of them who put their time in for free to help people. So that's all I got to say about that. Um, I think we're going to move on. Let's pretend none of that stuff happened and let's have a productive conversation here. So um, first, just want to start off with a general introduction from Michael, who you are, how you got into trading, how long you've been doing it. So Michael, please go ahead. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, well, obviously, with the, the three letters that uh, you know, draw attention to, the order blocks is the ICT guy. And for the most part, everyone is familiar with me, either knows me by PB Pips or someone that, that either uses my stuff and has shown some ability to find some setups. And they want to know what it was that led to that. And either directly or indirectly, it leads back to me. So I guess in 2010, um, I watched a forum online, which is commonly known as uh, Baby Pips today. It's not like it used to be, but I felt inclined to you know, kind of like put some information out there because I saw a lot of folks doing things that I used to do in the 90s, and it was like spinning wheels. Um, I'd have intermittent success, and then the, the success would be eroded by a, a long series of losing ideas and never panned out well. It was all retail stuff. So everyone knows that history of uh, what every new and or every new and or aspiring forex trader wants to know series uh, that I did over there, uh, and it was really like a social experiment for me. I wanted to see if I could spur up enough interest to get someone to try to do what I felt I was able to do by taking all this information, failed trading, um, starting with commodities, of all asset classes, and seeing if I could create that same, you know, incubator or test tube scenario that I felt I came up through. And it wasn't that I was trying to uh, eventually go to a mentorship because I devoted a lot of time, a lot of time yeah. to that. And it was, to me, it was very engaging because I would get a lot of feedback and it was a, a, a ability for me to go back and relive all those events again, seeing people's frustrations and overcoming those frustrations and their excitement about you know learning it all so i guess really that's the the, the bulk of what everyone knows me at you know a baby piss but i was doing things on america online in the 90s and it was with stocks and commodities back then so everyone thinks of me as a forex mentor but prior to 2006 you know i was a commodities trader and you know, stock options and things like that I didn't really want to go into Forex until I got involved with uh, Chris Lord, his material. So I learned a little bit more about the spot market and other avenues and approaches and using things I've learned from my own experiences. And in 2006, I had to segue to, to FX only. Okay. No, very cool. So I know that's going to be one of the questions I think a lot of people have, you know, why you chose the FX market. Uh, you know, over other markets, but um, we can kind of get into that when we get into the Q&A section. So I know, obviously, the style of trading you do is price action focused, uh, no indicators. I think that's why a lot of people are drawn to it. Uh, crypto is a very memeable community. I'm not sure if you know the term meme, but um, it, there, there seems to be a flavor of the month uh, with the TA that is going on in the crypto space. But one thing that tends to stay true and that I think people are drawn to is nice clean price action uh, trading because there's not all of these indicators busying up the chart. There's not all these various colorful things that are distracting from what's really going on. Uh, and I think people are always looking for that quick fix. If I can just slap on this indicator, it's going to tell me uh, you know, when to buy, when to sell, etc. So if, what does price action really mean to you? And, and if you could just kind of summarize why you don't use indicators. Well, first I was inducted the same way everyone else is you know, the more things you can put on your chart the more smart you feel and eventually yeah you know, i had so many things on my chart i couldn't see price and i started forgetting about price and just focusing on what the indicators were supposed to be telling me and it was not painting out well didn't do very well doing that and as 
time went on, I started to remove things less and less, not because of uh, the understanding of the importance of over time and price. I was just couldn't, I couldn't trust an indicator because if you put enough indicators on there, they're going to conflict with one another. So I gravitated to a simple you know, moving average, 50 day moving average and an hourly chart and a stochastic you know, the settings you range between 14 smooth by three or a 10 smooth by three. And that is basically used oversold conditions to, to go long and commodities. And that was all I was doing over time doing that. I would see that when the market was in bearish rotations, where it would be in a, in a mode where it would be better for you to be a shorter or bear, uh, I wasn't able to do anything with that. I was predominantly a bull. So mm -hmm. after learning a couple of things, um, one of the books that I learned a lot from, and I know it's probably one of the questions, but uh, there's a book that I learned a specific pattern called Turtle Soup. And it was one of the, the main ideas that helped me understand going short because I just couldn't understand it. How can you sell something you don't have? So once I started doing exercises by looking at past data and back testing the, the theory, I became more inclined with just price action alone. I didn't want to trust the indicator and being someone that's, you know, tinfoil hat. <laughs> I yeah. don't like to trust things. I don't like to just take someone's word on it and just go along with it. Because mm -hmm. I got, got sucked into that by buying thousands of books and all those things and those courses and those you know, supposed teachers kept saying the same stuff. And my results weren't showing me that it was worth you know, investing any more time or money into it. So I stripped it all away and said, okay, if I'm going to be able to do this, I should be able to see it in price action. Because, I mean, everyone knows classic support and resistance and classic chart patterns, but they don't work all the time either. So I, I was believing at the time as an early trader – that this thing was rigged from, from jump. And I just couldn't figure out what it was that was going on in a price action, but I knew there was a storyline behind it. And over time, uh, meeting individuals, um, learning more about what I do wrong and looking at price action, I developed an approach that just simply relies nothing on uh, uh, indicators. Okay, so what was the name of that book again? We just had a quick live question there that you read where you learned turtle soup. Do you remember the title? Uh, before I go into it, are you going to ask me a question about what books I recommend? Because I okay, let, let's save it for the end. Yeah, do you, if you have a list prepared, I know that, I know a few people were interested in what kind of trading books uh, you might suggest. So um, obviously, you know there are other purveyors of price action. I know Tom Dante. I know you've mentioned Chris Laurie is someone that I think you respect as a as a mentor out there. <laughs> Um, in terms of in terms of how your price action trading might differ from someone like Chris Laurie's, are there any major differences? Is it just how you view the market, or do you think you know there are more than one source to learn price action trading? Well, I've said this before on record many times. Um, when I first watched Chris Laurie, now his early work is not what I'm referring to. Later on, he started refining more of his um, price action studies. And I kind of like told people, hey, look, pay attention to this guy too. If you don't like me, you don't like my attitude or my, my arrogant, uh, you know, I, I have an attitude. Okay, I have a, a bit of an ego and sometimes <laughs> I rush people wrong. Long and short, Chris Laurie is a very, very upstanding gentleman, very nice guy. He's pretty consistent with his delivery. Um, it may be a little dry for some other folks. But his work, in my opinion, is if you're not going to learn from me, learn from him. And yeah. I limit it to just that. There, I don't, there's no one else I can say, okay, go to this person or, or learn this. Because there's a lot of things that Chris does that I agree with. And I've mentioned we, we did uh, webinars together and had many discussions on the phone and, and through email and such. And there's a lot of things that I agreed with. And Thomas said, look, I, I – I subscribe to those same views and I used to do that stuff in futures trading. But there are some things that Chris holds an opinion on that I'm not going to share with here because it would be viewed as disrespectful. It's just a difference of an opinion. Yeah. What that, what that is from, from, okay, I'll just say my view. I believe 100% that the previous, uh, view of the markets that's been held on to forever is that the markets are a free traded market and 
it's completely random and it's built on supply and demand factors. Therefore, we don't know what's going to happen. And you yourself have seen that I have things that help you determine what the previous information from yesterday will help you determine what today's high and low is going to be and sometimes the weekly high and low. If it wasn't that consistent, and I found this in my own studies, then I would, I would understand someone arguing with me saying, well, you know, there's, there's no validity and they're not making the previous day's information to set the next day's high and low before the fact. Mm-hmm. I believe that. I believe that these markets are absolutely controlled to the pip or to the point, and they know where the high and low is going to be at. Uh, if you talk to someone else, you know, like a Chris Laurie or someone else that teaches price action, they're not going to subscribe to that view because their psyche doesn't go that direction. And plus, it's it goes against the grain. It makes traders uncomfortable because they're, they're fearful of that manipulation because it permeates this industry. Oh, my broker got my stop. Well, that's the business. That's what goes on. The broker didn't push the price there. He just opens the spread a little bit more. But the central banks are driving the price to those levels. So when my studies direct my attention to that and my students to that phenomenon, what leads to that, I don't rely on fundamental data. I'm looking for where's the money that's going to hurt the most, and it's going to go there. It's going to, it's going to take the path of least resistance to get to it. Yeah. And, and I think that's something that maybe just the terminology confuses people in the crypto space because, you know, they hear central bank and they say, OK, well, that sounds, you know, like fluff or some bullshit. At the end of the day, anyone, in my opinion, who I see who's a good trader knows that there's an extreme amount of manipulation going on in, you know, the Bitcoin market, for example. And we're starting to see a lot of those same traces of this manipulation per- pushing price to very specific points uh, to to get to get liquidity and, and take the path of least resistance and you know the perfect example was over the last couple of days uh, you know with the target of 7800 uh, to me that was a very 4x like setup that was occurring in Bitcoin so you're seeing this more and more um, so I think it's naive for people to think that the game is fair uh, to think that it's not manipulated and one of the favorite things that I learned you know while studying your material was it's it's about spotting the smart money spotting where the manipulation is going to occur how it's going to occur and and trade with it really right when the elephant enters the pool when the large orders enter the market uh, there's going to be footprints Uh, and that's something that really stuck with me uh, in terms of saying okay well if they have you know this large of a position where are they going to have to take it to exit their position they're going to need a counterparty they're going to need a ton of liquidity and that's when things started really tying together with me when i had that kind of manipulative mindset in terms of okay how could they manipulate uh the market and then where would they need to take it in terms of actually looking at the chart uh to execute and fill their orders um no so thank you for that so i guess the next question would be obviously i know you're you've been trading forex for a long time now um i believe you've mentioned in the past the reason you kind of were, had your interest peaked into crypto and Bitcoin was because of your nephew, if I'm not mistaken. So in your opinion, do the same concepts work in crypto, in Bitcoin, and what would have to happen for you to start trading it? Well, obviously, when, um, when it comes to crypto, and if you go back through my uh, Twitter feed, you'll see that I was very, very cynical on the asset class because it's, I got hammered every day either by email or direct message or just, you know, tweets direct to me, why don't I trade crypto? And I didn't trust it. You know, and, and to be quite honest with you, I, I don't trust it yet. I, I'm interested in it, obviously. You guys are seeing me participate more in my commentary regarding the asset, but I, I don't personally trust it right now. Um, would I do it in the future? Yes. If it's there, if there's enough of the signatures that I look for, and there, it's growing. There's a lot more things that... Uh, for instance, if you look at um, Bitcoin, for instance, yeah, I got the chart up ago, here. Five years ago, the, the things that I teach, I didn't see a whole lot of it. You know, it, it just seemed like it would spike. It felt like penny stocks to me. Yeah, and I can't trade penny stocks. I don't. My stuff, in my opinion, doesn't work on penny stocks. And I'm sure there's probably someone that's here that's done well with it or lost money doing it and whatever. But it's my opinion, and it's not meant to you know to distract anyone that's using my material because i've actually seen like folks like yourself and my nephew jay if you listen hello the uh the approach to actually using it and it's one thing for me to give a commentary about it and say i think that it's not going to twenty thousand; it's going to go to six thousand that's just words 
you know, I don't have any skin in the race. I don't have anything on the line. It's just my opinion. That's what people asked for. So there's, that's what I gave. Um, it was only based on things that I subscribe to in terms of price action. I don't know how to put a trade on with crypto. I wouldn't even know who, who to set up an account with. But I think personally, uh, after looking at it deeper because of my nephew actually making real money in it, the, the allure is there. You know, because I actually, obviously I have an audience that's interested and they want to know if what I do is applicable to crypto. And my answer simply is this. There are some things that are just inherently generic that are going to work. And that's why I'm kind of like keeping everyone's focus in the realm of crypto, just simply to looking for the liquidity only. Yeah. The time aspects and kill zones and things like that, I don't personally feel that they're as pure and and respective as they are in forex that's the reason why i like forex over crypto and i like that um vehicle over futures contracts because we don't have well we don't have it anymore anyway because we have like electronic trading but i came from a world of uh, uh, you know the outcry pits where we would have session closing and the next day's opening would create gaps unless you looked at the globex market overnight you wouldn't know what price was doing between that gap and yesterday's uh close we didn't see that with Forex. Mm-hmm. So it was like 24 hours of very uh, liquid. So that was what took me out of the futures and moved into trading spot. Well, crypto, much like when you heard back in the 80s and 90s, you know, don't trade commodities, you know, you're going to lose your shirt. Everyone has to have this growing phase and uh, uh, an appreciation for an asset class. Is it going to happen for me in the next two years for crypto? I don't know. Okay, I'm, I try to be as honest as I possibly can in regards to my uh, opinions about it. I, obviously, everyone sees me. I, I have an interest in it. I'm using the things that I do. Sometimes it's really accurate. Sometimes I don't have anything I can talk about, and it frustrates people that want to trade based on my commentary, which I don't advocate. I don't want, you, I don't want anybody to get hurt with what I would say. That's why I always tell everyone as a crypto guy, which I don't consider myself at all, I'm a noob. I have no idea what's going on in these markets except for the price action that I discuss on their charts. So hopefully that's answered that question. No, definitely. And so, I mean, I think uh, Bitcoin and crypto is evolving. We now do have futures and and, and things like that. So I suggest next time you're, you're, you're fooling around with charting, you should check out uh, the XBT um, tag because that will be for bitmex and so there's actually swaps there's there's spot contracts there's also futures contracts now so it is changing uh but i think the the principles remain the same in terms of price action price seeks liquidity um you know i have a couple of your quick tweets up here and what i'm gonna do for everyone uh because like i said at the very start i think form your own opinion about michael's content don't listen to anything that you hear online find out for yourself there's enough there that you can determine if you put the time in and look through his Twitter and look through those videos whether or not this stuff works. And I, I've got a tweet, a couple tweets up from you here. Uh, December twenty second, two thousand seventeen, Bitcoin to six thousand. Uh, so that one worked out very well. <laughs> um, so and just the other day, uh, you know, you posted that long with a ton of detail before and after, showing the entry, showing the stop, showing the draw, uh, you know, the target profit. Uh, and it worked out precisely and perfectly. And and I think it's funny because a lot of people online will say, oh, well, you know, he's not posting up setups and entries. Or I'm of the same mindset. I think spoon feeding people is the wrong thing to do. Uh, you're not going to learn anything if you're given the exact entry, the exact exit, the exact target. There, there, there's no point in that. And And for me personally, I know in crypto, there's a ton of people who have this desire to prove that they trade a prove how much money they're making and how good they are and i don't know if it's just to pump up their own tires i don't know why they're so keen on impressing a bunch of strangers on the internet but to me uh you know i hope you guys who are all posting your live trades from bitmex showing you know multiple gains on bitcoin positions that you have really good you know opsec uh because I don't want to advertise how much money I'm trading or making, especially when it's cryptocurrency and it's online and I have an online persona. Like, I don't want to get hacked or something like that. So, I mean, I think there's just this this weird thing in the space where people want to show off and they want to flex their muscles saying, look, I made this trade. Here's my exact entry. Here's how much I made on it. 
And like to me, it's like that doesn't matter because that doesn't do me any good. Uh, I'm not making that money. Uh, I post analysis, I post charts, and you know I think Michael does much of the same. What you decide to do with it uh, is up to you. Uh, but I can confidently say, if you guys, for those of you who are, of you who are Twitter savvy, just type in Bitcoin and BTC, and then tweets from Michael, and just scroll through his timeline, and line up those tweets with the charts, and you will see that. For someone who's openly admitted that he does not really know how to trade crypto, uh, he does not actively trade crypto, he is a hell of a lot more accurate in terms of targets and where the market is going than 99% of the traders with a bunch of followers who are posting about crypto. So do the research yourself. I'll post a link to it maybe with the video of the specific search. Just line up the tweets with the chart and you make your own decisions whether or not these things were called in advance or if you want to say that they were you know, hindsight again or if he just got lucky because I don't know how many times you can get lucky in a row before it's no longer considered lucky. Um, but that's just my opinion. So um, we've got a lot of questions here, Michael. So I'm going to start with some questions from the Discord. Uh, and then we'll go to some of the ones on Twitter. I'm sure some of them have probably been answered, but we'll we'll try and uh, we'll try and minimize overlap here. So questions for ICT. Okay, so the first question is: so can you share some insights with us about handling emotions in trading? So I mean, obviously you are very much a technical trader, but psychology is a huge part of the game. I know this is something you talk about a lot in your videos. Do you have any rules or processes in place to control your emotions when you're entering a trade and how to keep clarity once you're in the trade? Well, as a new, as a new trader in commodities, I was all over the place. And I suffer from uh, bipolarism. And it's very difficult for me to stay focused on things. So it would, seems like I'm very cool, calm, collected with my trading and things. It's actually very hard for me to focus. So... I get very emotional, like anyone else, uh, if I have to wait for a setup, um, I have to um, re-enter a trade that was stopped, and I still think the setup's there. All those same things, I'm not immune to that. I have all those same uh, pitfalls that every trader has. Just because I've been doing it over 25 years doesn't remove that element of trading. That's, I've made it very clear. I hate trading. I hate it because I don't like the uncertainty. Now, I feel confident about certain things, and because I have a, I have a rule-based idea around time and price, there's a time I look for certain things. There's a specific thing I look for at a certain time, a certain day of the week. Uh, it's very generic. If it weren't for those things, I would be an emotional wreck. I wouldn't be able to trade personally because there has to be some kind of a structure. So one of the things I think that is necessary for traders is – and I'll mention this when we talk about books and you know, how the impact was when I started reading other people's opinions about what they encountered. But for me personally, it wasn't until I got highly structured with my time, which is the, the whole point of the last YouTube video series I did with two videos, because it, it really drives home the importance of knowing what you're supposed to be doing right now and what's the contingency plan. Because if you don't have that, you're going to be acting on your emotions. You're going to be doing things that you're not supposed to be doing because you want a feel-good moment. And it's important that folks separate their real life and the things that go on in the real world from that of what's seen in the chart. Because there's a lot of times, you know, and everyone listening, if you've done any trading whatsoever, whether it be a demo, paper trade, or live money, you know what this feels like. You, you're you're not having a good day, you're depressed, whatever, something's not going right, or you're bored. That's the worst environment. Getting in front of a chart is deadly with live funds because you're going to try to take yourself to the casino, and it rarely ever pans out well. So the emotionalism that comes along with speculation is overcome by, number one, removing the leverage, Okay, controlling that element of, I need to make a lot of money right now. You don't need to make a lot of money right now. You need to put a lot of time in. The element of uncertainty is what causes a, a great deal of stupidity on the part of trading. Um, you, you do things you shouldn't do because you don't have discipline. And the reason why you don't have discipline is because you don't have a trading plan. The reason why you don't have a trading plan is because you've never sat down and figured out what it is that makes you tick as a person. All these things take time. And putting a video up or subscribing to someone's podcast or, or, or course or even me, especially me, I have a lot of moving. I have a lot of moving parts with my stuff. So it's it seems 
high end. It seems very technical and precise, but there's a whole lot of things that go along with that. And you have to be structured in your approach to study, not only my stuff, but anyone else's stuff. Just simply reading a book isn't going to do it. You have to have a, a plan. <laughs> and we, we hear it all the time. It's a, it's a, it's worn out, you know, trade your plan. Well, what's the plan? And people don't spend enough time discerning what it is that they gravitate to. And a lot of it has to do with their personality. You know, if we are a sprinter, you know, if we, we like to do things real quick, um, you know, that's a scalper day trader right there. And trying to make them into a position trader isn't going to work. It doesn't line up. So overcoming emotions or having that psychological draw, I want to take a trade, or I, took, I just took a trade, but I lost. I'm afraid to get back in. All of those things are overcome by having, number one, experience from the chart, seeing these things pan out over time, desensitizing yourself to it, and then submitting to the process over a long period of time. You're not going to do this in a year. You're not going to retire in a year, regardless of what Bitcoin does. You know, Nobody bought the low and held it all the way up to 19-something. No one did that. Okay, they, they, as much as they want to say they did it on, online, they didn't do it. You never see them proving it, and it's really not important. What we do as a trader individually is what matters. It doesn't matter what I do, how much money I make, or how much I lose, or whatever. You have to pay your bills at the end of the day. You have to see your spouse, your children. You have to look them in your face, and, and you can't fake that, that moment. And if you lose control in the marketplace, I, can't, I guarantee you it leads back to no discipline, no trading plan, and you haven't put the time in to desensitize yourself to prove that these things repeat. And even though they may not work right now, and they may fail in the next four or five attempts, it will eventually go back in sync and it'll, it'll offer you an opportunity to do so. And losing your mind over one setup or a series of uh, losing trades, you know, it shouldn't be done. Yeah, no, and I, I can't agree more. I mean, I think there's an interesting thing in this crypto space. I think part of it is because of how fast it goes up when it is ripping. Um, a lot of people got rich quick. Um, and it, it, it messed them up mentally um, because everyone wanted to make that quick buck. And so I think a lot of people who then transitioned, you know, from making a bunch of money on these altcoins to trying to margin trade, you know, Bitcoin and they're using a 15 minute and a five minute chart <clears throat> and they're not understanding why they're getting destroyed. I think it's a large part that reason people are looking for that quick buck. They go into the market just saying, I need to take a trade. I'm in front of the chart. I need to take a trade. And um, what was one of the biggest kind of quantum leaps in my trading was, first of all, using TradingView, I would publish ideas. I would, I would look for a trade set up and I would publish the idea privately. It was kind of my own trading journal. And I would just see how it played out later. Because if you don't write anything down, you're never going to know if that idea you had last week played out. But sometimes I'll forget, but then I go back in there and I say, oh, look, it, it played out perfectly. Or it didn't. Why didn't it play out? And I started keeping notes about what went wrong on certain trades, uh, you know, what I could have done better next time. But the biggest quantum leap for, for me was uh, taking less trades. That's when I really started seeing my account grow. And just the level of accuracy in terms of the trades I was taking go up was when I stopped taking a lot of trades, I zoomed out um, and I was taking maybe two, maybe three trades a week, uh, but they were perfect, it, all, it, as perfect as they can be in terms of my opinion of a setup. Just all of the things in my trading plan that I needed to see to take a trade would line up and it didn't happen every day, but it happened twice a week and that was enough. Uh, I didn't have to catch every move. I didn't have to buy Bitcoin at 6,000 and sell it at 19,000 because I caught three of the swings up there, you know, as good as you can do it. So uh, I think that is something that's, you know, a, a lot of people need to take take into advice, have a plan, have a journal. Uh, Michael is not the only person that preaches this. Pretty much every good trading book and every good trading person you find on Twitter will will say the same thing. You should have a plan. You should track your trades and and things like that. And when, you, when you're when you robotic like that and you have certain parameters that must be met to enter a trade, it, it takes a lot of the emotion out of it because if, if certain things happen, it happens. And then if you're in the negative, it's okay because it's within your risk tolerance. You're not stopped out yet. And I think that helps. So uh, th this is kind of a related question. Obviously, you've said before that you know, you're know you a journaler. Do you do you do things in Excel? Do you paper journal? Where do you keep your trading journal? I've dabbled with uh, electronic formats and spreadsheets and, and things, but I've always gone back to high touch, not high tech. Uh, I'm, I'm a dinosaur when it comes to trading. I mean, I was back when <laughs> we didn't have 
all these resources today that you guys are spoiled. I, I wish I had all these things back when I first started, but I, I keep a journal. I actually draw out um, the time frames with a pen, you know, a, not a pen, but a mechanical pen. And everything that I do is all written in a leather journal. And I probably have you know, three or 400 of these things, you know, stashed away in, uh, in my library. And it's all the things that I felt about every single trading day. I enter every single trading day, whether I take a trade, whether I don't take a trade, uh, my opinions, what's going on in my personal life, all those things are logged. And if it weren't for me doing those things, I wouldn't know the things I know and, and act on them like I do. So no, I don't do anything like, uh, like I know there's uh, uh, something wonk. It escapes me right now, but uh, it's like a online tracking thing you can do that allows you to do journaling. Um, all those things it is a matter of personal, you know, opinion and what you what you like to do. Whether you do it with a, a pen and pad or you know leather bound journals like I do, or if you do it from an electronical standpoint, um, doing you know the spreadsheet, it doesn't make a difference. But you need to do it because if you like you said, if you don't if you don't write it down. And say the say the thing. Their idea pans out. We as humans, we look at it and say, "You know, see how smart I was." And but that's not the lesson that journaling gives you. You want to see what the process was and what you had to contend with before that thing un, uh, unfolded. Earlier, just a moment ago, you said that you transitioned from a, a more frequent type trader to uh, less trades and more quality setups. I, I was wanting to, you know get a chance to ask you while you were saying it. And I, I think it's important here because it goes along with journaling. The process and time and what you had to contend with, doesn't it or didn't it rather feel counterproductive to want to move away from high frequency pursuits of setups? And what did you feel going through that? Like what was the, what was that process for you personally going from I have to do something every day to I'd rather look for more choice setups? What was that like for you? Yeah, I'm very much like an ADHD kind of guy. Um, I'm very, I like things quick. I like things fast. I have a hard time focusing for a large period of time. So I felt like I was missing a lot of moves and it was frustrating initially because I would say, okay, I'm not taking a trade today because, you know, X, Y, and Z didn't line up for me. And then I'd come back and I'd see the market ran a couple hundred points. And I'm like, well, shit, <laughs> I, I missed the move again. And at least initially, I would go in and I would try and chase it. I would say, okay, well, it's ripping now. I'm going to hop in long. And then, of course, that's exactly when it tops out and it goes the other way. Uh, and it was almost like surreal how wrong I would be sometimes uh, when I would get emotional and I would take that trade based on, you know, emotion, greed, fear, whatever. Uh, and it, it took a while to get past that saying, listen, I'm not, I'm not, there's always going to be more opportunities. Uh, and I have a lot of people who messaged me about this like thousand dollar rip Bitcoin took, and they said, "Should I get on long now at eighty four hundred?" I said, "Well, no, you missed the line share of the move. Wait for the next setup." But that used to be me. I saw it rip a thousand bucks. I was like, "Oh, I better buy it." Um, so that was very hard to overcome. Uh, but once I did, I stopped having that fear of missing out, the FOMO. Uh, and I think that's something that's super prevalent in traders is they have a fear of missing out. They see the market moving and they're not in it. And it's crazy. A lot of a lot of traders are doing these live streams of them trading, uh, which I think is a cool concept. Saying, "Okay, I'm going to turn you know one Bitcoin into ten live," but to me, that's just saying, "Okay, well, that means you got people watching you live. You have to be in the market, so you might be taking a trade that you normally wouldn't take because people are watching." And you're like, "Well, I got to get in the market. I got to do something." So I think that's counterintuitive and, and and counterproductive. And I think one of the issues at large in crypto Twitter. Uh, is everyone wants to look like they're always right and like they caught every single wick and every single move yes. and that's so yes. counterproductive to your own learning like if you can't post a loss it like Twitter should be a journal if anything I mean other than a way to connect with people and exchange ideas if you're going to be posting your trades post when they go wrong don't just post when it hits your level precisely because you're doing yourself a disservice trying to show off to everyone that you're never wrong exactly. And you're never going to improve. You're going to detriment your own learning for what? To have a bunch of followers. There's a lot of big name accounts on Twitter that are 
selling what they call ICOs. They're like an IPO, but for a coin. Uh, it's ridiculous. And a lot of them are scams. A lot of them don't work out, but they get paid a couple hundred bucks, a couple thousand bucks to promote this because they have a huge following. Well, it's like, well, if you were trading, you probably wouldn't need to you know, promote these things, but you've already kind of classed yourself as someone who's like, well, this guy never is wrong, or this guy doesn't even post charts anymore. It's just ass backwards, the whole community. And it the more I'm in it, the more and more I seem to dislike it because I just I don't get what people's motives are. It's like, are you trying to be a trader or are you trying to be an internet personality? Because they're two very different things. I don't have anything wrong with building a brand and using that to make money. Crypto, I was having a great conversation with someone about this. Crypto is a bubble in a lot more than one ways. It's not just the price of these assets going up. There's all sorts of business opportunities out there as well. So, I mean, capitalize on it however you're going to, but don't go under the guise of a trader and only post, you know, correct nailed entries just because you want to get a bunch of likes and you want people to think you're, you've are you caught, you know, the absolute top and the absolute bottom because you're, you're just going to put a, a, a detriment or stop learning because you're not learning unless you're making mistakes uh, and you're not yeah. learning if you're getting things wrong and then reanalyzing them and, and and going back and saying, okay, well, where could I have where could I have done better? So, um, yeah. question another question here. So, when it comes to liquidity pools and you know price going above previous swing highs and lows, how do you determine where you place your stops? I think a lot of people get confused with your material occasionally because you'll say, okay, well, market is going to target liquidity under old swing lows and swing highs. And then people say, well, if I'm entering a trade, am I not putting my stop below a swing low or swing high? Well, most of my setups are, are geared towards where the market's going to reach for. So in other words, I'm, I'm not looking for an entry when I'm looking at charts. I'm not, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for where is price going? Where is it trying to get to? There's a specific price level, not a direction, not a pattern or a measurement of, of, of some kind that leads me to a trade. Okay, All those things are all secondary. The initial thing that I do and I spend my time on is I look for reasons to justify why if, for instance, and this is what goes on in my mind, the internal dialogue that I have is, okay, I'm in control of price. Whatever market I'm trading, I put myself in the seat of someone that would have the ability to set the price themselves. And it probably sounds silly to someone that's relatively new or, or believes the classical support and resistance ideas and theories that go along with technical analysis. But this was the, pif the epiphany for me. I, I sit down and I think to myself, okay, if I were in control of price, where would I want to send price to be able to get out of the positions that just recently were entered. I don't necessarily have to be in at the low. I don't need to be there. I once I see something in the chart that justifies a move going higher, uh, you know, it's institutional order flow as I teach it. Uh, it might be viewed as trend to someone else, but I don't. I don't look at it as trend. It, there's a lot of signatures in price action that will give me the the confidence to trust the market on a higher time frame is going to move to a old high or just above an old high or continue through it. There's a lot of things that you know, go along with what makes me put a trade on. So I agree, I get it. I get emails like this all the time. You know, why didn't it go down there and run the stops? For instance, there's a gentleman that's asked on Twitter, you know, why didn't it come go to 5,000? Well, we've dropped a lot and we failed to go any lower once we made that low I tweeted. And it had signatures in it. Okay, I had things that I look for that made me say, okay, I'm going to step out there and say that this is the time to get in. I, I wouldn't want to see it trade any lower than this if it's really valid. And there's things that I'm not going to be able to answer because of time. I mean, there's so many things that go along with answering that question. But the main thing is, that, and this is the takeaway that you know I try to teach on my examples on Twitter each week for almost a full year now. By looking at your charts, regardless of what time frame it is, if you just simply look for where those equal highs and equal lows are, that's the easiest thing to determine where the direction is going to be. Because 80% mm -hmm. of the time, if you get some kind of a rejection at a low and you have equal highs somewhere in close proximity, that's where the market's going to go. And if you just look for those examples or in reverse, if we just have a, an old high rated and there's equal lows you know, in close proximity to where price is now, Whatever that range is, that's your range of opportunity. You can do things in the marketplace to, to take pips or points or whatever it is that you guys call it in crypto. Those opportunities 
are there every single week. Now, the problem is going to be is you're going to see them on one minute charts and five minute charts, and you're going to get crazy with it. You're going to try to do more things, more things than you should. If you operate on an hourly chart or a four hour chart, you're going to get more quality setups and you're going to understand where the market's going to go. You're not going to teach yourself this the first week doing it or the first month. You have to do it for at least six months. Do one pair or one cryptocurrency. You don't try to deal with all these different altcoins and, and uh, just use Bitcoin. That's all I do. I don't look at any altcoin. I don't have any interest at all. My focus is primarily on Bitcoin as a crypto um, student. It's all yeah. that because I don't. I'm not trying to make myself bigger than I am. I'm completely cognizant of where I am in grand scheme of things. But the things that I teach you and share every single week are based on that theory, what was taught in that scalping series. But I'm applying it to different time frames. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to overthink it. Yeah. Okay? And I think what happens is traders, they want an answer that's clear cut. You know, when I give the answer that is in truth to a new person that hasn't really spent any time with price action or studying it, like I teach it, you know, you're not going to learn it just by watching the videos one time. You got to you got to spend time in the charts, making your own notations, and then it'll click one day. How long will it be? I don't know. And, you know, with how how long was the time that it took for you to transition from high frequency seeking to I want quality setups? It didn't happen overnight, did it? it no took time. No, and I, I tell it's people perfect. this all the time. Um, they ask me, and, and I, I've openly said i said i've watched the free videos um you know and the market maker series the sniper series positions like at least three times all of them with significant times in the charts in between and it wasn't until i was practicing doing it myself and then finding what worked for me uh as opposed to maybe what worked for you in the videos i said okay i really like this setup and this is going to be a model that i'm going to focus on Finding this setup at this time of day, you know, with this type of market structure, uh, it, it took, I would say the first two years of me doing it, I didn't really know what I was doing. I was still losing more than I was winning. And I think in about Same year, again. the first two years, <laughs> so two years. yeah, two years, folks. I know. And two people, years. people, and again, I take this back to the crypto blowing thing up and giving people unreal expectations. I mean, first of all, yes, you can grow an account very quickly by having consistent returns. But to get consistent, you see, you got to put time in. And what most people don't realize is they say, okay, well, can I watch one video or read one book and learn how to trade? It's like you're trying to learn a new skill. If you want to be a doctor, you go to school for 12 years. If you want to be a professional hockey player, you shoot you know, a, a hundred thousand pucks, uh, you know, top left corner and then uh, in the top right corner and over and over and over again, it's repetition, it's practice. And it's no different to me in this than playing a sport or trying to perfect playing guitar. You have to put in literally thousands of hours and anyone who tells you otherwise, I don't know, maybe they're blowing smoke up your ass or maybe they don't know something that I don't know. But for me, uh, yeah, it, I've been trading for five years now and the first two years, nothing clicked. Year three, things really started coming together. And then by, you know, the end of year three and year four and five, I was consistently winning more than I was losing. And that's when I saw that compounding growth in my account. Uh, and that's what people forget. It's all about consistent returns. Losing money and losing your capital is one of the worst things you can do in this space because it's so hard to get back to break even. Uh, it, it is way better off having good risk reward, minimizing those losses. You're going to thank yourself later. Um, so I have so many, we have so many questions here, so I'm just going to try and pick and choose some because we're obviously not going to be able to get um, to all of them. So I'll, I'll do my best just to pick ones that I think uh, everyone can, you know, glean some good information from. So we have one here. If you had to start from scratch, what three specific things would you focus on and learn first? That's actually a very good question. Um, if, I, if I was starting out new... I'm assuming that I didn't know anything right now or starting, like, I don't have any money and I'm building it up. Like, yeah, brand new. Okay, um, I would I would spend more time um, learning about myself and what makes me react. Like, am I emotional because of things that go on in the social media? Like, do I get excited about what everyone else is saying? Because if I do... I would have to remove myself from that. But if it doesn't have any bearing on 
what I see in price, then it's not a problem. That, to me, is one of the biggest cancers in trading because if we get caught up in sentiment ideas, herd mentality, you want to weigh that right now. If you're new, determine whether or not that if that's actually toxic for you or if you're actually getting something from it. Second, do your own research. You spend time with price action and charts, developing an approach that meets and matches your personality. You know, don't don't try to force yourself into a mold. Don't try to do things that uh, you know, you're not going to eventually. You know, I don't want to be a position trader. I tried it. I can't do it. I'm a day trader. That's it. I'm a short term trader. When I can't do um, a swing trade, that's pretty much what I'm looking to do. Spend time defining what you're trying to accomplish in your trading. Because if you try to skirt that, you're going to waste a whole lot of time and you're going to waste a lot of money if you rush to get into it. And if you also, this is the third thing, avoid getting into the money. Okay? You will make whatever you want to make, okay, if you put time into understanding what you have to do to get it. Everyone wants to rush to the, you know, the front of the line and avoid all the pitfalls and they just want to make the money. I preach this and I'm ridiculed for it, but I teach from a demo standpoint because it allows you to look at things objectively. There's no money coming into your pockets. There's no money coming out. So if you're starting out, you need to submit to a minimum of six months in an environment where you're not even in a demo. You're just studying price action. Then the next six months, you do simply demo. So the first full year, you shouldn't even be trading with live funds. Now, you're going to hear all kinds of people make all kinds of comments of that, and if they're listening, they're probably going to hit the Twitter. <laughs> okay, this is ridiculous. You're never going to learn that. But these same people won't be here three years from now. They yeah. won't. Okay, or they'll be bitter because they've never been able to get their money back, and they just feel comfortable doing those types of things and you know, being negative. But if you want to learn this, those three things that are stated there are the biggest barriers I've seen from educating people over the last 20 years. They are consistent. You know, we, we deal with Twitter and, and, and Instagram and Facebook today, but it's no different than it was on America Online back then when we had message boards and instant message. You know, It's the same thing. People are, are, are human. You know, they, they're, they're not comfortable with themselves. They're going to attack something that you're doing. And if you gravitate to those types of things and it becomes an impediment on your learning, you, 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 you crippled your development. Yeah. So you have to think about yourself as a person before you do anything with chart or you do anything with trading. You got to think about what is becoming distractions for you. And if you don't identify them early, you're going to waste a lot of time. You're going to listen to the wrong people. And I'm probably, I'm, I'm probably not the right person for some of you. You know, I'm, I'm probably going to be a, a barrier to your learning. It may require you to do other things, learn some things about the retail universe do very well, be break even for a little while, or even lose money, and then come back to me at a later time, and then it'll be more useful to you. So it, it, you have to be flexible. You have to be flexible in, in, in terms of your your expectations and allow the process to take place. Yeah, I, I did paper trading for a couple of months where I wasn't trading any funds, and then one mistake I made with the demo, for those who, and demo is possible in crypto, there's something called testnet, but uh, in Forex, it's, it's, it's a lot more common. Uh, one of my first mistakes is my demo account had $100,000 in it and that was bad psychologically because when I put my real $1,000 account on, I said, holy shit, I'm not trading the same type of pips and the same type of you know, position size, etc. So I would say if you are going to demo trade, which I do think has tons of value, um, do it with a realistic position size. Make your account what you would actually put in there. Don't demo trade with $100,000. It's not realistic. Um, unless you're trading with a hundred thousand dollar balance, and uh, the so uh, t for the demo aspect, I mean, I think it's silly for people to make fun of someone for practicing. If you want to practice and lose real money, I mean, go ahead. Uh, but I, I took the demo route initially. It helped me greatly because when you put on your first live trade, it's different psychologically. And the more yes. you can prep yourself for that moment by saying, "Okay, I got to be objective. This is no different than before." That's gonna help you not go through that emotional roller coaster when it goes against you a little bit. Because if you're staring at the trade and it's it goes against you, people will freak out and close out their trade. It's like, okay, well then, what was the point of having a stop down there if you're not gonna allow yourself to be in a drawdown for at least a little bit? So, 
again, one of those things about the crypto space, I have no idea why people are, 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 are memeing or making fun of. It's like, sorry, people want to practice and not potentially lose money. Not everyone has the money to fuck around and, and blow an account. Um, you know, so the demo, the demo can be, uh, can be good. So for, there's a lot of similar questions about where you can find Michael's stuff. He has a YouTube page with, I believe the majority of the videos uploaded. He also has a forum with a, a literally almost a hundred hours of video uploaded. It's all free. And I can honestly tell you there's enough in there that you could trade the shit out of Bitcoin, uh, with just those free videos very successfully, very well. Um, so let's, uh, is there seems to be another common question about books. Do you have a list of books you want to share with everyone? I get this question a lot. So uh, I have over 2000 books. Okay. Both in digital print or, you know, in, uh, in binding in, 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 in real tangible books. I spend a lot of time. I do about eight to 10 books a month. I'm an avid reader. And I think that one of the, the unfortunate things about our industry, whether it be crypto or, or Forex or futures, uh, trading as a whole is um, it, it's, it's saturated with worn out, un, you know, unsustainable ideas that you know, this is what you have to do and repeat this only and slap this on your chart and, and you'll be fixed. And, and unfortunately, all the books I've read, and I've read a lot of them, and pretty much anything that comes out new, you know, I, I, I go on Amazon and just buy them up too. It's the same stuff. It really is the same stuff. And you aren't going to learn anything by books except for you wasted your money. If you look at a few books, and I'll list them now, um, and, and this, these are, in, in my opinion, the ones that made the most impact on my personal trading. First and foremost, uh, Trading for a Living by Alexander Elder. Um, not so much his triple screen approach or anything like that. While that is useful, and if you're a brand new trader, you want to start with something to give you a foundation, I think it's okay. Um, but the things at the beginning of his book, talking about the psychological aspects and how we as humans think, um, like it's almost like a self-defeating um, mechanism that takes place. I mean, that's why I did that pod, well, not podcast, but I did a uh, SoundCloud presentation. Are you, you know, do you deserve this? You know, are you deserving? It, we sometimes can carry mental baggage into this, and we say we want to quit our job, we want to do things, you know, on the heels of financial independence based on our trading, but really, you're not ready for that because you don't feel like you deserve it. You know, you bought into the, the, the storylines that your friends and family will tell you that this isn't for you or it's a pipe dream. You're not going to do it. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I came from a family that always belittled each other. They just simply you know, didn't like anyone else in the family doing well. And I didn't want to be like that, but I also didn't want to be poor like they were. So when I was telling them I was going to learn how to be a trader and I was going to do, I was laughed at all the time, you know, and I grew up around drunks. I've never drank alcohol in my life, never did any kind of substances whatsoever. And I'm trying to be on a high horse or nothing, but I'm just telling you, I came from that. I didn't want to live like that. So I gravitated towards Alexander Elder's book because it made sense to me in how alcoholics live their life. And they have jobs, okay, but they throw everything they do in terms of building up their life away because they don't feel like they deserve it. They go out and they, they do the same thing every weekend and they waste their money drinking. Some of you guys that are young, you think that's the lifestyle you're going to be wanting to do when you make money and you're, and you're, you're doing the trader's lifestyle. That's just stupid. It's dumb because what you're doing is, is you're putting yourself in a state of mind where eventually those things are going to creep in and mess you up. So I like Trading for a Living by Alexander Elder for that reason. Um, the, the next book is uh, Technical Analysis of Financial Markets by John Murphy. I think that's the Bible, if you will, of retail trading. If you learn everything in that book and then the right times to fade it, you, you master price action. I mean, to, to me, I believed it when I first bought it that this was going to be the grail. Like, it made sense because there were so many lines and indicators. He knew everything about every indicator and had something to say about it, but I never made money using it. So yeah. once I understood institutional order flow, I turned it upside down and then faded it. So it works perfectly then. So that book, 
uh, technical, uh, technical analysis of the financial markets by John Murphy, um, only because it gives you the, a, a, a pretty broad synopsis of retail trading uh, perspective. Awesome. Larry Williams, um, How I Made a Million Dollars. To me, that is the, the defining moment for me for understanding how the markets work using the Commitment Traders Report, understanding premiums and commercial bull markets and all those things that go along with commodity trading. Um, I use a lot of those things, as you know, uh, in my analysis for Forex. And it's just, it's true today. The things that were written in that book, it's the same things that I don't subscribe to, like the, the moon phases and stuff that he did, which I thought was interesting in the book, but it's not it's something I subscribe to. Um, Street Smarts is the book earlier um, that I was referring to about Turtle Soup, uh, Linda Rashk and Larry Connors. Uh, again, Street Smarts is the uh, title of the book. It gives you like little snapshots, little snippets, if you will, of specific trading criteria for pattern sake. Um, when I learned how to uh, maximize the uh, ability to be a, a short seller, that book did the most for helping me understand what shorting was. Uh, I understood a little bit because of Larry Williams' um, information regarding it, but it still I wasn't comfortable with it. But if you're looking for specific uh, criteria to look at trade one for short-term trading, that book was a defining uh, milestone for me. And today, you know, I would still if if I could go back in time and and tell you when I saw the price tag for it for $175, I I was nervous. But I was thinking to myself, it, it's 175 bucks. It's got to have something in it. I was already thinking I want to return it if it's not going to live up to it. But it knocked my socks off because it was so perfectly written. It's not saturated. It's not real wordy. Um, it's right to the point. And to me, when I saw that pattern, Turtle Suit, it's, it made so much sense to me. It made everything click for me. So I love that book for that reason. Um, and Momentum Pinball was one of the things I approached with uh, my S&P trading and when I was day trading the uh, futures contract for Spooz. So I like that book. Um, both volume one and two of Market Wizards because it gives you the internal um, struggles and, and storylines of really successful traders. And I like the ones that were interviewed that didn't just talk about how much money they made, the things that they had to endure to get there because I don't I didn't have what you guys have right now today where access where you can talk to people online that are mentors or people that are willing to you know sacrifice their time and energy and resources and money for people they've never they're never going to meet so you have the advantage of that I didn't have that I had 40 to 50 times reading market wizards that's what kept me going and I wasn't feeling like I could do it and it wasn't making any sense to me you know looking at these charts I needed to be motivated and it's very hard to be motivated. You know, when we don't have someone to, to look up to or try to pattern yourself after. And I try to come, I, I try to be consistent with that each week. I don't try to give you a lot, a thousand different setups. I give you one idea and try to teach you to be content with that. I learned this by experience, but I probably wouldn't have been the trader today. I am now, if I had access to social media like this and mentors, I probably would be a lot more busier. So everything works in all lines, I guess, for a reason. But um, those books, I like. Um, anything really apart from that, um, I like a couple different rare books, and I'll send you – it's probably better if I did a, a tweet with them. But they're rare, very, very rare to get a hold of. Um, you can get PDF files of uh, certain ones that they're, – they're very dry. But um, to me, you know, they're just really good. But – I don't recall the exact titles of them. Um, I think it's Toby Crable breakout something, you know, patterns of short term breakout, something like that, um, which is like a classic. And it's mentioned in Street Smarts. You know, I paid five hundred dollars for that book, and oh. it's really, really hard to get it in print, but you can get PDF files of it. Okay. And anything you can get from Ryan Jones or Ralph Vince for money management approach, um, gaming theory, um, yeah, optimal F. All those things that go along with uh, you know managing your money and how to optimize all that, uh, I think they're they're the best in, in the realm for uh, money management. And Larry Williams turned me onto that with his uh, utilization of uh, Ralph Vince's Optimal F, and then Ryan Jones came behind that and made it even better. So 
if you uh, are wanting to learn more about money management, they're the two guys that I think are the best. And that's it. Awesome. Out of 2,000 books, you know, there's not a whole lot else to talk about because it's the same regurgitated stuff. I, I do think we are spoiled, um, you know, having access to YouTube and to video content and things like that. And, you know, I think that's something that I think people forget. Um, you know, people used to pay a lot of money to learn this kind of stuff. And when people say, okay, well, for some reason, there's this connotation in trading that it's like, well, if you're a good trader, you should never have to charge to teach people. It's like, well, I don't know in any other business where you can tell me just because I'm good at it, I have to show you how to do it for free. Uh, no one no one works for free. Um, putting time in creating content and helping people takes time away from you being in the market. Um, it's something that you don't have to do. So why should you not be paid for it? And they're all of the best trading stuff that I've consumed uh, in my five year journey, I've paid for. Outside of initially finding your free videos, and I've, I've openly stated I took the mentorship, um, you know, I've, I've taken Do Tom Dante's webinars, there's other people I've paid for their content, and that's been the best content for me. And if there was a leap for me, personally saying, ah, like I'm paying for this, how do I know it's gonna be legit? And I've, I've paid for ones that don't work. Uh, you know, it is happens. There are people out there who are selling stuff that's, you know, just a bunch of indicators and a bunch of crap. Uh, but at the end of the day, nobody works for free. And there's just weird connotation. Maybe it's not as bad in the Forex and stock space. I feel like it is, though. Um, but in crypto, where it's like, oh, if you got to pay for something, um, you know, they must suck because they must not be able to trade. Don't let one bad apple spoil the bunch. I know there's a lot of scammy paid like groups in crypto. And I know there's a lot of scammy Forex mentors. I can personally say Michael's a real deal. I know there's thousands of people who uh, agree with me, thousands and thousands, and uh, maybe they're not on Twitter shit posting because they're in the markets killing it every day. I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm the crazy one who's spending all my time on crypto Twitter. So I know we're getting a little bit over an hour here, Michael. Do you have time for a couple more questions? A couple quick ones? Got 10 more minutes and that's pushing it. Okay, so uh, here's a good one. Upon opening a brand new fresh chart, it's not marked up. What are the two most important things you do to determine the institutional order flow for that day? Um, I look for, number one, what is a monthly and weekly chart indicating? Is there a reason to suspect it's going to continue higher or lower? And I start with that premise in mind because something set in motion generally tends to stay in motion. And then I look on the daily and four hour for what I just mentioned earlier. You know, equal highs and equal lows. That's my first go-to because it's easy. It helps me right away determine where the most likely uh, probable direction is because if I can determine that, that it's 80% of the battle. Getting in is, you can be wrong in your entry if you get that right. And if you just put your spot in the right place and don't over leverage, you'll get pips or points every single week doing that. Okay. Next thing is, is I want to look at the day of the week um, because there are certain things that I teach in my pre-tutorials that if it's going to be a bullish week, generally it's going to be a Tuesday that makes that low of the week 70% uh, of the time. But understand that what I just said was the low is formed or the high is formed on Tuesday. And if, and this is important because a lot of people say, well, I did the numbers and it doesn't figure. You have to apply the filter of when the higher time frame monthly and weekly are suggesting it's going to be a bullish week or a bearish week. If you add that filter, 70% of the time, Tuesday creates the high of the week when it's bearish and low of the week when it's bullish. Understanding the element of time and price, Tuesday's a turnaround day where you know it sets the initial week high or low, and sometimes it may get rated on Wednesday or it makes it on Monday. That's that gray area. It's like the roulette table at casino. It's not red, red or black. It's red or black and sometimes green. So yeah, that's the risk that's inherent with it. But those are the things I predominantly look at you know, when I sit down with a fresh chart every single Saturday. So top down, guys. And and, and if, as someone who has back tested it, it's scary. Works really well in Forex. Uh, and I've seen it applied in crypto. If you guys don't follow my boy Ribs, uh, he's a guy who has Michael's pictures with Bitcoin in his eyes on, on Twitter. <laughs> he has done some great back testing on crypto. Uh, showing how you know the London Open, the New York Open, the high of the week is forming, where the Asian range is, and he's applying that to crypto, which is going to be relevant to a lot of you guys listening. Go check it out. Don't just discount it. Try it your fucking selves. The charts are free. Uh, you can get in there and do it. Um, so 
Michael, what would you say uh, was your best trade you've ever made? In 1995, um, I went long, the Japanese yen, and I just applied, you know, what I felt was what Larry Williams described as one of those commercial buckets where you just want to wrap hands around it, hold on tight, close your eyes, and come back to it six months later. That's That was the trade that literally changed the whole landscape of my whole life. You know, I didn't have to be at a job anymore. I didn't have to be at, uh, you know, the, the beck and call of a boss. I, I felt that I was going to be set for life, and it changed the whole viewpoint on the markets with me. Um, and then after that was was coffee, but uh, but long and short, that was the that was the market. And every single time, you know, I've ever traded Japanese yen since then, it's like they try to get a little bit back. So I don't like to trade that, uh, yeah. that currency anymore. But that was the one that changed it for me. What one's the beast? J JPB uh, Japanese yen. That one's got crazy volatility, man. I seem to get roasted every time I try and trade that pair. Um, Okay, great. And we'll do we'll do uh, uh, the, the the very last question here. And if you have any closing comments, uh, please. Someone wants to know. Uh, it's a two parter. What's the most fascinating student you've ever had? And uh, can you tell us an embarrassing story about yourself? Remind everyone you're human. <laughs> <laughs> um, the most embarrassing moment. Um, I I put a trade on for a hundred dollars per pip, and I wanted to buy, and I went short. And I, I literally had no idea that I did it until actually I did it. And a report came out because, as you know, I don't have any fear of getting in the market before a, a news driver or a market report. And it dusted and went right to a full stop at 25 pips. So uh, that was one of the most embarrassing things because I was actually doing it in front of someone. I was training live. They were sitting right next to me. Oh, no. And I blew it out right there. And they're like, what did you just do? You said you were going to do the opposite and you put the trade in wrong. And that was very embarrassing. But uh, yeah. I'm human. I mean, I'm, things like that are happening to everyone every day. So you have to remove all the distractions and, and things like that are going to occur if you aren't physically dialed in and paying attention. Yeah, and crypto, we call, that the fat, we call that the fat finger. <laughs> um, as far as uh, a fascinating student um, or what, what student fascinates me, all of my students fascinate me. There's not one that, that pales over the other. Obviously, I'm interested in you because you've gone through my work and you're applying it to an asset class that I've, I have not done. So to me, I'm very fascinated with that. I, I think it's I'm intrigued by it because these are the moments that started this whole thing when I stepped out in the late 90s and said I wanted to teach other people. I want that experience. I want that experience of reliving it all because I see this stuff all the time and it's boring to me. I get to relive that excitement, that moment of astonishment. And you know, if you take this material, and it's not limited to you either, everyone that's doing it, you all are doing something I didn't do with this information. To me, that's exciting because it's an asset class that I'm still not ready to do anything with, but I see other people doing it and they're making really good money with it. That to me defines the reason why and rewards me as a teacher and a mentor because I get to sit back and watch someone else do something that I didn't do and they're doing it better than I would do it if I went in myself. That to me is awesome. I yeah. get to have that moment. I tell my wife all the time. I don't find any more enjoyment in anything else in life more so than when I watch someone take something that probably their friends and family said they're not going to be able to do and they do it and they start realizing that the entrapment that we have with working a job, which is the worst thing in the world. It's worse than prison. Subscribe to that mentality for the rest of your life is stupidity. And I want you to realize that there's ways to do it. It doesn't have to be in crypto. It doesn't have to be in Forex. It can be done in stocks. It can be done in index. It can be done in bonds. You know, all these asset classes can be, you know, rated, you know, every single week like this. Yeah. And to me, all of my students fascinating because not all of them are interested in crypto. Yeah. And not all of them are, are trading Forex either. Some of them are really in, some of them are trading just index or and, and, and e -mini literally futures. killing in bonds. So. Yeah. No, so I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I'm a big proponent of the law of attraction and, uh, you know, you kind of create your own reality. And when you let yourself get programmed into thinking that you need to work some job, <laughs> for the rest of your life and answer to someone that's as soon as you kind of fall into the trap 
Uh, and this is just one mode of, you know, giving yourself that financial freedom to, you know, go out there and, and, and do what you want. And, um, yeah, so I think that obviously, you know, wraps up uh, your time here. So I won't keep you any longer. I really appreciate you, you know, coming on here and, and spending the time with us. I think, uh, you know, this was productive. I think anyone who had any questions just about your intentions as a person, hopefully have those answered now. I mean, like I said, I, I, I plea with everyone before you make judgment, just go and do the research yourself. Don't listen to what some person on the internet says, whoever it is. Because that, that person is not you. That person is not paying your bills. Uh, do your own research with everything, whether it's in crypto and coins you're buying or people you're looking to spend your time studying from. There's enough information out there for you to make your own judgment. Uh, again, let's stop with all the hateful shit, whether it's directed at Michael, whether it's directed at Flood or anyone. It's a waste of time, guys. Take that energy. Put it to better things. Go read a book. Go outside. Go in the charts and study. Uh, shit posting and shit talking people on Twitter and Discord is just negativity, and that's gonna affect you negatively going forward. I'm a big believer of karma, so cut that shit out, guys. Um, Michael, again, thank you so much for being here. I will be posting this on YouTube. I will share the link with Michael for his fans. Uh, I'll share the link on my Twitter as well, so anyone who couldn't catch this live will be able to watch it. Uh, Michael, any last comments or thoughts on Bitcoin, big picture, in your last 30 seconds here? Um. Everything I've said uh, pertaining to Bitcoin is in my tweets, and just for for the sake of uh, being fair, because obviously there's, I'm sure there's people that had questions and they didn't get answered. I'm, I'm very accessible on Twitter. You know, you, if you didn't get your question answered, you, know, you can obviously tweet it to me, and when I see it, I'll, I'll respond to it in the, in the most fairest uh, way possible and honest as, as I possibly can without going to uh, detail that would obviously, you know upset the, the people that are in our group but there's a lot of things that you're going to learn by going through my free stuff and i put a lot of time and effort into that with the anticipation of never ever ever charging anything but unfortunately there's folks in this world that took my stuff and started selling it and i took a great deal of offense to that so there's a couple different uh, trademarks i'm waiting for them to be uh, approved on and once that occurs I'll reach out to a couple of people that I think have abused my charity. But if you do the time and you look at the stuff, and it's only a thing I'm asking you to do is go through the free tutorial. If you do that and you invest the time in yourself, not me, I don't want you to worship me, I don't want you to high five me on everything you do or give me the credit for the things you're doing because those trades that you put on, you took the risk for that, not me. And I appreciate you know, the, the the consideration that folks have when they do that, but I'm not, I'm not asking for that. All I'm asking for is an email privately to me, the, the, the feelings that you, you, you get, okay. Or the storylines you do with the success you find in it. That's all I really asked for. And if anyone that is interested in what I teach does that, we've had the exchange I had in mind from the beginning. Yeah. And I wish everyone good luck and good trading. Thank you so much, Michael. All right, guys. Uh, Thanks again to ICT. Thanks again for everyone for tuning in and we'll we'll catch you next time. Signing off here.